we recognize this morning, we know that you are the only one that can satisfy. You are the only real joy giver. And we come to you this morning as we open your word. And we ask, Lord, that you will speak to us. That you will open our hearts and our eyes that we can understand what the Spirit wants to say to us. We ask it in your name. Amen. Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time, and then I go to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. On the last and the greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said he is the Christ. Still others asked, How can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him. But no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and and Pharisees, who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. You mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Has any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, There is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it. You will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. So far the reading of the word. Now in chapter 6, the previous chapter, we have read that Jesus was speaking about himself as the bread of life. And that you have to eat him to receive life. And he was also speaking in chapter 3, 4, about the water of life. That he is the one that can satisfy our thirst. And in a land where water was very scarce, it was a wonderful example to express the need of salvation to the people. The benefit of salvation to a thirsty soul. And here in chapter 7, we once more find a wonderful picture that Jesus uses to illustrate what it means to believe in him and to receive salvation. It's almost a golden invitation. Many people are admiring Jesus, or they are impressed by him. But that is not sufficient. You must go further than that. You must receive him. You must accept his invitations. 
Six months later, after this event in chapter 7, Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate asked him the question, or asked the crowds the question, What shall I do with Jesus Christ? What shall I do with Jesus Christ? And that question is a question that every person must answer. It's such an important question that everyone's eternal destination depends on that answer. What do you think about Jesus? And when Pilate asked the question, the crowds answered. They screamed back to him with one voice, crucify him, crucify him. That was the expression of that day. They declared on that day that they reject the invitations of Christ. They rejected them all. He offered them for three years life. He invited them. But they called for his execution. But now in this chapter, chapter 7, and as we go on in a few chapters in this gospel, we see that Jesus is still making invitations. He's still telling people to come to him and to receive salvation. Because he says in verse 33, I will be with you a little longer. But then I will not be there. You won't be able to find me. There's a certain period, a certain space in which his invitations come to us. And we need to respond. And Jesus would make it very clear to the people, and he repeatedly said that, that salvation is not possible apart from him. John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So we see in verse 37 a glorious invitation. On the last day of the feast, the great day, one of the great feasts of the Jews was the Feast of Tabernacles. And during that feast, and that was the feast Jesus was attending with his disciples, they celebrated the time in the wilderness, the 40 years they spent there. And during that period, God protected them. He preserved them. He gave them food and drink. And finally, they entered the promised land. So to commemorate that event, God instituted this feast. And every feast, on every day of that feast, there was rituals. Rituals which they repeated. And what they did was they took branches of palm trees. And they used those branches to create shelters. To commemorate the wandering in the wilderness. And to remember the goodness of God. Now the high priest would go to the pool of Siloam. And he had a golden pitcher in his hand. And he would dip it in the water of the pool of Siloam and he would come back. And he would pour the water over the altar. And that was to remember the time when God provided the waters for the people of Israel at Meribah. When the water came out of the rock. And as he poured out this water... They recited, the people recited Isaiah 12, verse 3. With joy shall we draw water out of the wells of salvation. So that whole ceremony was a time to remember the wandering in the wilderness and how God provided for them. And it was also symbolic of salvation. God saved his people. And we read in this verse, but during that festival and during that remembrance, on the last day of the feast, and people differ on what the last day was, if it was the seventh day or the eighth day, but that doesn't matter so much. But on that last day, the important day, they also walk seven times around the altar to commemorate the marching around Jerusalem which spelled the end of the wilderness time and wandering. 
And on that moment, when they celebrated that, that God delivered them, He brought salvation to them. Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Verse 37 says, he cried out. Kratzur, the Greek word. On the top of his voice, it was as if this was in the uppermost of his mind. It was so important for him, he wanted every person to hear it. That critical moment of the celebration. Jesus was saying, you are thankful for his salvation in the wilderness. Your fathers were satisfied with the water God gave them. He provided for them. But now, there's another salvation which God has provided. He has sent me, his only son. Come to me to receive salvation. A wonderful invitation, a glorious invitation. But he's calling the people to action and there's three uh, vital words in this passage. Calling to action tells us those who are thirsty, they can come and they can drink. Three words that tells us of the elements of salvation. What must happen to every person that comes to faith in Christ? Every person that wants to be sure about salvation must experience this. The first one, first. Everyone, if anyone is thirsty. And that means that you have to know and experience a first. You must have a knowledge of your problem. A knowledge of your own deprivation, your own condition. If anyone is thirsty, almost an unlimited open invitation, a universal one. As God tells us in John 3 verse 16, God so loved the world. He's calling people. If anyone is thirsty. Anyone who is thirsty knows that. They are aware of that. And the more first you become and the more your first increase, the more anxious you become. Some people that almost go into a kind of madness if they cannot get a drink of water. Jesus is speaking here not not about the physical first, but the thirsty soul. And the one, the person who knows that he has a need, as a longing for deliverance, as a hope for deliverance, longs for peace, for forgiveness, liberation from sin. There's a craving. So anyone who wants to come to Christ must show that need, must be aware that they are thirsty, that their souls are empty, that they are not full. That's also where evangelism starts is to let people recognize their need. When you want to win people for Christ, you don't tell them in the first place how good our church is, how many programs we have. No, they cannot be won by that. They must know their need for Christ, like the jailer who called to Paul and Silas. What must I do to be saved? That's a cry of a thirsty person. Thirsty person cry, what must I do to be saved? And there's not a lot of people like that. They don't know they need, but that's where it started. Everyone that says, I'm thirsty, Jesus says, let them come. And that's the second thing. They must come. You must approach Christ. Look. 9 verse 30, 23 says, If anyone will come after me, when you know you have a need, you can only run to Christ. You know He's the only one that can satisfy your first. You come with your heart. You come with an empty heart. You come with your need. You come with your mind. You come with your heart. 
You move towards Christ. You abandon yourself. You are, you are prepared to abandon everything to receive that water of life. You will abandon your sin. There are so many people that say they are Christians. But they carry their sin with them. They've never experienced that sin is like sea water. It continues to make you thirsty. You abandon your self-confidence. If you really want to come to Christ, you must come to the point where you know, I cannot fill this emptiness in my own soul. So the only qualification is a first. Not religion. Not good works. Not being a basically good person. That's not the qualification of Jesus. I said, everyone who is thirsty, let them come. The religious people in the day of Christ, they were the people that hated him. They hated him. The morally good people, they hated Christ. But it was the sinners, it was the tax collectors, it was the outcasts who came to him. They were thirsty. And they were looking for water. The third thing, Jesus said, you must come and drink. You must appropriate this water. It doesn't help if there's a river flowing through a dry valley, but you don't drink of that water. You remain thirsty, you, you don't go to that river and you drink of the water. No, it doesn't help anything. And drinking means to take him, to receive him as your own, to embrace him. As Jesus said to that woman at the pit in Sicha, drink and you'll never thirst again. One person wrote about this in a hymn. I heard the voice of Jesus say, behold, I freely give the living water. Thirsty one, stoop down and drink. And live. I came to Jesus, I drank of that living, giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in Him. That's what every Christian can say. Christ satisfies. I have Him, and I need no more. He's comparing that first. And that come and that drink to believing. It's almost the same. Verse 38 says, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, as said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So with this invitation we see something remarkable. That this water which Christ gives to the thirsty soul, to the one who comes to him and drink, what will that water do? What is the effect of that water? It tells us we are not buckets or reservoirs. That water goes through us. We are to be fountains and that fountain becomes a river. It's not only to drink for your own soul. But that water must become rivers of living water. Living water. Water that gives life, that flows from us. And he tells the disciples and everyone who is hearing him that the river and the life he gives is so abundant, it's so full of supply. It must be a constant blessing to everyone around you. And he tells us that river of living water is the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit that he'll give to his church and to every believer. It's an ever-flowing stream. It's a constant stream. It's a life-giving blessing. So this verse tells us that the impact the believer can have on the world we not only receive for our own souls refreshing, but we receive that salvation, that conversion, that justification, that adoption 
with God as our Father, and we become rivers that flow to the world. We receive a blessing to become a blessing. We receive the sovereign grace of God so that we can be channels of that sovereign grace. So that's why church cannot exist only for themselves. The church must be a place where there is life. The church must be a place where the Holy Spirit is so at work that when people come there, they, can be, they are able to drink. And to receive life. Christians must be a society where is this fragrance, as Paul says in another place, of life and to life. And it's so sad that in so many places the churches is not that. The Christians does not bring life. One person has said the problems in the world. It's not the world, it's it's not they that is the cause of it all, but the Christians. They are the cause of many problems because they are not salt. They are not light. They are not a fountain of life. They are quarreling. They have a lot of problems within them. They don't, they don't give life to the world. And Jesus said, he's speaking about the Spirit. And the Spirit didn't come at, didn't came at that time, but at Pentecost, the full blessing came to the church. That's why when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, but the river started to flow, 3,000 people were converted. He preached on another time, 4,000 were converted. And after that, 10,000 of people were converted. And from Jerusalem to Samaria to the ends of the world, the river was flowing. The Spirit brought life. And even to this day. So Jesus is telling them. For those of you who come to me. And drink. You'll be satisfied. But more than that. You'll become a river of life. To the world. Your life won't only have. A meaning for now and here. But for eternity. What a wonderful invitation. Wonderful invitation. What was the response? can maybe see four responses to this invitation. The first, verse 40, when they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Always when the message of Christ is preached, people are responding. You must respond, you must have an answer to his invitation, will you accept or not? And many received the truth. They thirsted, they came, they drank, they believed. The second group, they rejected the truth. They are always there. They said, still others were saying, surely that Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? They scorned him. They mocked him. The Pharisees, the religious people of those days, they mocked Christ. They did not accept His invitation. They were willfully ignorant. And there were a lot of divisions. There was a third group as well. It seems as if they were confused. They were in a struggle. Some of the soldiers as well. They were almost paralyzed by the words of Christ, but they were be- bewildered. They do not know what to do in On the one side, Jesus is saying, take me, receive me, believe. On the other side, the leaders telling them, arrest him, kill him. Jesus is saying, receive me, I'll give you life. The leaders say, arrest him, but we can give him death. And they were pressed from both sides. They don't seem to have responded positively. And then in the last place, they... We see the one person there again. The one who is in the process of yielding Nicodemus in verse 50. We have read about him in John chapter 3. Jesus was speaking to him about the new birth. And we haven't read of him for a, for a year or two. But we see his name here again. And he was arguing with his own group, the Pharisees, in telling them, you cannot act against the law. 
You are people who uphold the law. You cannot act against the law. And he, they were mocking him as well. You're not from Galilee, are you? But he was searching for the truth. And we see later in the Gospel of John, John 19, verse 38 and verse 39, after the death of Christ, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for the fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission, so he came and took away his body. And Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing mixture of myrrh and aloe, about a hundred pound weight. He took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen and wrapping with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. But Nicodemus, hearing about the new birth, was in the process of seeking, and as the Bible tells us, those who seek for him with all their heart will find him. And he was such a person. And we find him in the burial of Christ. Now he's Lord and his Savior. So we see in chapter 7 a wonderful invitation, a glorious invitation of Christ. He tells the people, I am the one that can satisfy your thirst. I am the one that can relieve you. I can give you life. You are seeking for meaning and purpose. You can come to me. And if there is anyone who is thirsty, it doesn't matter how your life was in the past. Jesus will accept them. Anyone who comes to him with that first, believing in him, preparing and ready to abandon an old, old life. So the question is still for us to answer. But Pontius Pilate asked, what will you do with Jesus? Have you ever asked, answered that question? Maybe the Lord is ask, asking that question to you this morning. What will you do with Jesus? When you hear his invitation this morning, come to me, everyone who is first. Have you ever come? He's calling you. He's calling us to come to, me, to him. What an invitation. While there is still time, may the Lord help us to experience the joy and the full life and the satisfaction that there is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you came to this world as the Redeemer, as the one that can save, the one that is the light of the world, that can give life. We see all around us that people rather accept darkness than life and light. But still, you are inviting us. Still, you are calling us. While many may reject you, you are still calling and waiting for those who are thirsty and want to come to you. And Lord, if there is anyone this morning that, want, that, that experienced that first, that longing for meaning in life, that longing to be saved from their sins, may they come this morning to you. In your love you accept us. And in your grace you give us new life. And may every one of us experience it personally. We ask it in your name. Amen.